which may be one of the most familiar chapters in the Gospel of Luke, if not the whole Bible, a very familiar passage and story, which these are kind of hard to preach. You guys know a lot of this already, so, (laughs) Um, but what glory there is here, and I've been waiting to get to this chapter for some time and excited to to preach this, this sermon. The title of our sermon is Lost and Found. Let me pray for us uh, once more for the Lord's blessing on the reading and preaching of his word. Father, we, we come before you and we ask that you would uh, increase our love for you, our trust in you, as we hear your word preached. We pray that you would bless its reading and, its, and, and the preaching of it, uh, that you would grant clarity, that you would grant um, Uh, a love for you, Lord, as we see your joy over the repentance of sinners that you bring about. May we be those who uh, love what you love, rejoice in what you rejoice in, and would mirror your uh, marvel at the lost being found. And Father, we thank you for your finding us, seeking us out, and Uh, that you brought us to yourself through the gospel, through someone telling us about Christ and your spirit drawing us. Lord, we would be lost if it were not for you seeking us out, bearing the burden to bring us to yourself. And so we give you thanks. Encourage us this morning in Jesus' name, amen. Well, follow along as I read uh, Luke chapter 15. Uh, I'll read the entire chapter for us this morning, even though we'll just look at the first 10 verses, but really the whole chapter has to go together. It's one unit, and so we'll read it all this morning. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, saying, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost." Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field 
And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the living God. A little over a year ago, our family was at the beach together, and uh, we were uh, enjoying a family vacation, and our youngest son brought some action figures with him, and one of them in particular that he kept playing with, and we were having a fun game where we would, you know, put him in funny places and take a picture of him sitting down, the action figure, and, and one of the days he brought him to the beach, and as he was playing with him in the course of events, he, he buried this action figure in the sand. And uh, when it was time to go and we were packing things up, he started to look for, for him and he couldn't find him. He was somewhere in the sand, but we lost him. And so we had to leave and, and we left him. Well, the next evening, I believe it was, we were taking family pictures together uh, somewhere else on the beach, a little bit further down. And as we were walking back to the parking lot, Joni saw a hand sticking out of the sand. <laughs> And she reached down and grabbed it, and there was Carl Burbank, the action figure. <laughs> and, uh, and we found him, and it, was, it is the best lost and found story that I have to tell. <laughs> How in the world did we find him lost in the sand? I have no idea. He was reaching up to be found. <laughs> Well, that may be the best one I have, but this morning beats that by far. This is by far the best lost and found story in Luke chapter 15. The word lost appears eight times in this chapter. It is throughout. One writer put it like this, There are 100 sheep and one is lost. There are 10 coins and one is lost. And there are two sons and and both are lost. And what is the main point of these three stories? It is simple. It is God's joy in the repentance of sinners. God's joy in the repentance of sinners. See that in verse 6, in verse 9, and verse 32. Yet, Jesus emphasizes this joy over the repentance of lost sinners to accomplish another point. Uh, really what he is doing is he is defending why it is that he spends so much time with tax collectors and sinners, some of the most notorious sinners, some of the, the worst people among the religious elites. And so he actually tells these stories to convict them, to convict the religious leaders who don't understand why Jesus would do this, who are grumbling over Jesus doing this. And so the main focus of why he emphasizes the joy of God over repentant sinners is to expose these religious people. Dale Ralph Davis summarizes uh, in the way he, only he could, in his humorous way, he says this about the chapter. He says, quote, The whole parable isn't about the prodigal son, nor in one sense about the father. It is about the Pharisee son. Or it's as I've sometimes called it in pulpit exposition, the parable of the Presbyterian son. <laughs> that is, Jesus' parable does not so much address the raunchy sinner as religious ones. It is not calling vile but virtuous sinners to repentance. But we're not there yet. That's next time. This morning, we're considering the first 10 verses, which will set us up for that. And these verses set the context for the final climactic story that Jesus tells about the two sons and the father. But this isn't a monumental chapter. I looked uh, just to see. Um, 
uh, sometimes I like to read a Spurgeon sermon on, you know, a text if, if I'm going to preach, if I have extra time. And I looked, and it, it, I found 18 sermons that Spurgeon preached on this chapter over the course of his whole ministry. And so, uh, needless to say, I didn't read any of them, <laughs> but uh, you know, I kind of just scanned a little bit. Uh, Charles Dickens, uh, the writer, called this chapter the greatest short story ever written. And Dickens knows a little bit about writing good stories. This chapter as well is somewhat centrally located in Luke's gospel. Um, We are in this middle section of Luke's gospel from really chapters 9 to 19 where Jesus is journeying towards Jerusalem, towards his death, and we're a lot of unique material to Luke in here. But here in chapter 15, we're kind of at a central point, and it really highlights what Jesus is all about. In fact, we might argue that, we have argued actually in our study of Luke, that the the main theme verse of Luke is Luke 19.10, that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And here is an essential chapter that illustrates that very point of how, how God seeks out the lost and how he rejoices in lost sinners. Let me give you somewhat of a breakdown of this entire chapter as we begin to look at it. What we have in verses 1 to 3 is what we'll call the complaint. The complaint in verses 1 to 3. It's the complaint of the Pharisees and scribes uh, that we'll look at in a moment. Then in verses 4 to 10, you have the celebration. The celebration. And this is seen in two stories that set up the last story. It's the parable of the lost uh, sheep and the lost coin. And the celebration that ensues by finding these objects. Then, in, uh, then the, the main story begins, what we call the story of the prodigal son, and it has three parts that follow the three characters in the story. The younger son, the father, and then the older son. And so you could call the, the one that focuses on the younger son the conversion. The conversion in verses 11 to the beginning of verse 20, where he goes off and uh, lives a sinful lifestyle, but then he comes to himself. He's converted he repents and returns. Then you have the father, and the, we'll call that the compassion. The compassion in verses 20 to 24. And then finally, in verses 25 to 32, we actually have the climax. The climax. This is, if, if this chapter were a joke, that would be the punchline of the joke. You can't just stop the story with the father's compassion because Jesus' main driving point is to set it up for this final climax so that his audience gets what he's trying to say, and it ends with the older brother. And so in many ways, he's primarily, we might say, addressing the Pharisees and scribes in telling these stories, though there are other crowds who are benefiting from this as well. That's very important that we understand that so that we get it right as we look at the chapter as a whole. This morning, we want to look at the complaint and the celebration, these first two points. So let's first dive in and look at the complaint in verses 1 to 3. And I broke this down a little bit for us, just to be able to follow along. First, I want, I want you to notice the interest in Jesus, the interest in Jesus. Look at verse 1 again. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. Who is responding to Jesus' message of salvation? Well, he says the tax collectors and sinners, and not the Pharisees and scribes. And we've made, made this point before. Who, who are these tax collectors and sinners? Well, tax collectors were uh, those who collected taxes for Rome. They had a franchise that they would collect taxes often from their fellow Jews, and, and they Uh, would often collect more than Rome needed, and Rome was okay with this as long as they got their cut. They would collect more, though, and so then in many ways they were robbing their fellow countrymen. They were viewed as sellouts uh, to traitors to their country. And then sinners uh, were those who were just characterized by some notorious sin. They were characterized by their sin, their scandalous sin. Uh, We've already met one tax collector who's come to the Lord, Matthew, one of the disciples. Later in Luke, we'll meet Zacchaeus in chapter 19. We'll even see a parable of a Pharisee and a tax collector in Luke chapter 18. And so we see these comparisons. But I want you to notice something in the context. Notice how the end of chapter 14 ends. In chapter 14, verse 35. It says this, it is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. He's talking about the salt that's lost its taste. It's thrown away. And then he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
So Jesus is given these incredible demands for disciples. And then he says at the end, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, notice how chapter 15 begins. Now the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to hear him, to hear him. Isn't that amazing? After the demands of discipleship in chapter 14, you think, who's going to draw near and hear this hard message? Here's the people who are doing it. The people who are some of the most notorious sinners, the farthest people from God, and they hear the demands of discipleship, and they say, I want him. I want Christ. Because they have seen the emptiness of their sin. They've, They've seen, they know the guilt of their sin. And they see who Christ is by the, by the grace of God. They're the ones that draw near. They're not put off by the demands, but they are pulled in further. They see that Jesus is exactly what they need, who they need. And so this is the interest in Jesus. That they want more. Then notice, secondly, the irritation. The irritation in verse 2. Here's a contrast with the Pharisees and scribes. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Pharisees and scribes were the experts in the scriptures and really the teachers of the scriptures. And yet here they are grumbling when they saw the likes of those who were drawing near. They grumbled. This is one of my favorite words in Greek. It's like, it's an onomatopoetic word, uh, diagoguzo. It sounds like grumbling, you know, you're guguzman. You know, that's what I, I like to think about when I think about grumbling. It's, it's actually used in the Old Testament in the translation into Greek for Israel grumbling in the wilderness. It speaks of unbelief. One commentator said this, the Pharisees and scribes grumble against God's appointed leader, just like Israel and Korah, Dathan, and Abiram grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Uh, Their problem is with sinners who seem to not be like them. And they view Jesus' interaction with these sinners as his acceptance of them in their sin. I don't know how they justified this. I could, we could maybe imagine some ways. Maybe they would uh, look at Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or, or sit in the seat of scoffers. Maybe they say, oh, you know, we just can't, can't have anything to do with these, with these sinners lest we be corrupted. It, here is the problem with their understanding. How do you reach people that you don't associate with? How do you make disciples of people you don't mingle with? And this is a great lesson for for all of us. For the most scandalous sinners to be saved, they need to hear the gospel. And for them to hear the gospel, someone has to explain it to them. And for someone to explain it to them, there must be an interaction and some kind of association with them. And we want to have that very culture to where, you know, sometimes people will come and they're, they're not really uh, initiated into like what is normal here and what we do. But we want to be the most welcoming to, for those who are interested in Christ, to, to make it uh, easy for them to incorporate with us and hear and, and learn and ask their questions about the gospel. And I'm, I'm thankful that I believe that is our heart. But notice what they're actually grumbling about. This is what we'll call the irony, the irony. Look at, again at verse 2. The Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. I call this the irony because what are they grumbling about? They're grumbling about the gospel. <laughs> this man receives sinners. How ironic that they grumble over that which sinners find to be great. What good news. Yet for them, somehow, it's bad news. They're like Jonah. In Jonah 4, where it says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. What, what displeased him? That the entire city of Nineveh repented. This is like one of the greatest revivals of world history. The, one of the most pagan people, the Assyrians, an entire, their main city. This would be like Manhattan. All of Manhattan gets saved. What? But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Why? And he was angry. And he prayed to Yahweh and said, Oh, Yahweh, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew 
that you are a gracious and merciful, uh, you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. I wanted you to kill them all. But you're just always like this, God. You're always gracious. And it makes me so angry. And that's the attitude that they have. They resented Jesus for how he saved sinners. What they failed to realize was Jesus came for this very purpose. He came to seek and to save the lost. Luke 19, verse 10. That's why the Son of Man came. Or just think back at Luke chapter 5, where another one of these interactions takes place. Luke 5, verse 30. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Do you feel the burden of your sin? Do you yourself know that you're a sinner? Do you feel guilt for what you have done? Or even do you feel the shame of your sin still? Well, I have good news for you this morning. This man receives sinners just like you. This is the good news, the grumbling good news of the Pharisees who spoke better than they knew. Their disgust is our delight. One writer put it like this, their grumbling is our gospel. Their dire accusation is our only hope. We become ecstatic over their damning words. Thank heaven for the gospel of the Pharisees. This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. What better news could there be? And so in this then, this ironic statement in which they are grumbling about, we see how approachable Jesus is. How approachable for the sinner Jesus is. If you've never repented of your sins, then draw near to him, repenting and trusting in him. He receives sinners just like you. Or maybe you're a believer and you're afraid to confess some sin and forsake some sin you've become entangled in. I have good news for you too. This man receives sinners. We may be just and yet sinners, justified and yet still we sin. One uh, writer, commentator, pointed out this story uh, that he got from a a devotional, and I just thought it was just too good. Uh, A man named David Roper, he told of a friend of his whose name was Edith, and uh, Edith told about the day, Richie knows this story, he told about the day when, uh, when she came to follow Christ, and she didn't have any interest in spiritual things, but she decided to, for whatever reason, one day go to a church. And so she showed up at this church, and the pastor announced his text, that it was Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. And he was reading from the King James Version, and here's what he read. He read this. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. (laughs) Uh, That's what was read, but this is what she heard. This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. (laughs) She sat up in her seat. (laughs) Eventually, of course, she figured out her mistake, but... Not after realizing that Jesus welcomes sinners, even one like her, even Edith. (laughs) And that stayed with her. How appropriate and how appealing and approachable our Savior truly is. Put your name in there because you too are a sinner. You are in Adam, having been born as a human being, and you are then uh, a sinner by choice. Those who are now in Christ are righteous in him. Just like being in Adam, we were guilty. Will you not come and draw near to him today? Who else will receive you like this? Honestly, I tell you, no one. There may be those who claim to receive you and affirm you in your sin, 
But here is a true friend who will receive you and yet deliver you from your sin. And so this is the irony that we see. This man receiveth sinners. And that leads then to the illustration. Verse 3 says this, So he told them this parable. Who's them? It's the Pharisees. It's those who are grumbling. And so as a result of that, he, he tells this parable. That's what prompts it. And, and uh, he, he's defending why it is that he receives sinners. And ultimately, we'll see, especially next week, he's exposing the self-righteous hypocrisy of the Pharisees who do not share the joy of God at the repentance of sinners. MacArthur puts it like this, The point, of course, was to show that the Pharisees' resentment of Jesus was unnatural, perverted, grotesque, and depraved. Their public display of indignation against him was irrefutable evidence that their own hearts were hopelessly corrupt, and they had no idea what pleased God, end quote. These three stories that Jesus tells defend why it is that Jesus welcomes sinners. The first two stories that we'll look at deal with a lost sheep and a lost coin, and the diligence one will exhibit to find a lost valuable object and the natural delight that comes when it is found. You search diligently for that which you value, and God values lost people, lost sinners. So that's the complaint. Now let's look at the celebration in verses 4 to 10, the celebration. And what you'll notice in these three stories, we're going to look at the first two, is they follow a similar pattern. Something is lost, then there's a a search that goes on, which leads to the object being found, and then finally the result is rejoicing. Lost, found, rejoicing. That's the pattern that we see. And um, under this heading of the celebration, we just see two points. One is the lost sheep, and one is the lost coin. So first let's consider the lost sheep in verse 4 to 7. He begins this way. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, If he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. He's trying to put his audience into the shoes of the character in this parable. And the Pharisees would likely not like to think about themselves as an unclean shepherd, nor as a woman in the next illustration. But that's how Jesus tells the story. But notice how he begins, "What what man among you? In other words, this is quite natural. Even if you don't want to think about yourself in this way, Pharisees, even you can agree that it's very natural and normal for the shepherd to go search for this lost sheep or this woman to look for this lost coin. Now, you probably don't have any sheep. Maybe you do. Uh, But maybe you've lost an animal before. You lost a dog before. Did you have to go out? Did you put up the staple, the signs on the, you know, posts and whatever? Uh, you, You go looking. And that's obvious. We, we know that. It's something natural to do. Now here we, we think in this ancient Near Eastern perspective where uh, you have shepherds tending their sheep. Of course, this happens today too, but this is very common for them. So imagine a shepherd after a long day and he's putting his sheep away in the pen. It's likely at this time that he would count them. And so as he's letting them in, he's counting them. 98, 99. Hey, (laughs) where'd he go? And he realizes that one is missing. And so he leaves the 99. And uh, the text is probably not wanting us to make the conclusion that he's being reckless in leaving them. He's likely leaving them in safekeeping. Uh, That's not the emphasis of the text. Uh, the, The idea is that one is lost. And so he's got the 99. They're okay. So he's going to search out for this one who is in danger. And a, and a lost sheep would be in danger because these animals need direction. They need care. They need shepherding. They're prone to danger if not cared for. In other words, if this shepherd does not go out and seek for this sheep, it will die. We've, in prior messages in Luke, we've, we've considered uh, the intelligence of sheep and, you know, had, had our, our fun with that. You know that. But here we can infer how God takes the initiative in seeking out lost sinners. The shepherd searches for and finds the lost sheep. He goes after the lost sheep. And then, when finding it, 
He puts the sheep on his shoulders and carries it back. Now, this is quite a burden, maybe between 70 and 100 pounds that he, he puts on his shoulders and carries back, and who knows how far away. But yet, appreciate that this imagery is not something Jesus is pulling out of thin air. This is imagery from the Old Testament. It's how God treats his people. In Isaiah 40, verse 11, we read this. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Or in chapter 49 of Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 22, God brings his people back. It says, Thus says Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples, and they shall bring your sons in their bosom and carry your daughters, uh, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. This idea, this imagery of carrying one on their shoulders. We can see the extent to which God goes to find a lost sinner in this story. He takes the burden upon himself to rescue the sheep. And what an image no doubt, of our Lord's bearing the burden of sinners to rescue them. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. One of the early Christian images before the cross even, likely, was uh, the popular image of a shepherd with a sheep uh, draped around its neck, around the shepherd's neck and like the legs tied up and carrying this. And sometimes they would accentuate how large the, the sheep was to, to show the great burden that their sin was that the shepherd had carried. To, to show and memorialize this reality that the great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, has borne them on his shoulders and has delivered them. What a precious image to remind us of our Savior, our strong Savior who sought us out and found us and endured the burden to bring us back. And so now the shepherd has this sheep on his shoulders and rather than complaining at how heavy this is, he's rejoicing, he's excited in his heart. And, and this is a contagious joy because he gets home and he, and he invites his friends and he, and he says, rejoice with me, I found the lost sheep. And it's this contagious joy. And we see that in verse six and he comes home, calls together his friends, saying to them, rejoice with me, I found my sheep that was lost. And then, of course, we get the point that Jesus draws out in verse 7. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus speaks about the joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. What a celebration there is in heaven when a sinner is converted when God restores one of his fallen image bearers that he has made for himself. Now Jesus contrasts this with the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So just think, okay, and he's making connections here in the story. There was 99 sheep who he left to seek, seek out the one who was lost. And now he says there's how much more rejoicing over one sinner who repents, more than 99 righteous, who's he talking about? What righteous persons that need no repentance is he, is he referring to? Likely he's referring to those who are self-righteous, those who don't see their need to repent. Heaven doesn't rejoice over the self-righteous, but the saved righteous. Once again, Luke 5, we, we, we read that passage. It's not those who are well who need a physician. Rather, Jesus called sinners, not the righteous, to repentance. In other words, there are no righteous people. No, not one, Paul will say. But there are self-righteous people who view themselves as just fine and not in need of repentance. Later, in Luke 18, verse 9, it says this, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Or you remember in John's gospel, after Jesus heals the man who was born blind, and here's how the chapter ends, because this man, is he was blind, but now he sees, and here's what some of the Pharisees say in 40 and 41 of chapter 9. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we blind also? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. In other words, they, they couldn't see their problem. 
Yet they were truly blind in their sin. The 99 then are unbelievers, and the one is a believer. Now, notice though the emphasis upon the one. This is amazing. You might think that God looks at the crowd, just the populace as a whole, and kind of an undifferentiated whole. But no, here, God looks at the individual. He rejoices over individual sinners who have come to their senses, as we'll see from man's perspective in the the later story. But they came to their senses because God granted them the gift of repentance and faith. And that's each individual God rejoices over. He rejoices over your salvation. How valuable is a soul to God? Only God knows. More, far more than we know. If we truly knew the value of a soul, how it would make us rejoice like God does when one is recovered. C.S. Lewis, in his uh, book or essay, The Weight of Glory, he writes this to help us to grasp the the significance of a soul. He says this, quote, It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. End quote. He's trying to get across the point that everyone you've spoken to is, in, is, is an immortal. They're going to live forever in one of two places. And if you could see what they would become as a saint, you would just be overcome in wonder and awe. But if you could see what they would become as the reprobate, it would be something of a nightmare. And so he says, just think about that. As you think about the value of an individual soul, you've, you know, the most uninteresting person is an immortal. And so let's remember how important each soul is to God and therefore to us. We do not look past one for another. We don't say, oh, I'm just finished talking to this person so I can get to that person, right? We say each individual is valuable and important. And each is precious to God. He sees individuals. He saw you. He rejoiced over you and your salvation. And God, of course, portrays himself many times in Scripture as a shepherd, especially in the Old Testament. But one particular passage that was likely in the mind of Jesus and the Pharisees, as he's bringing it up, is Ezekiel 34, where he condemns, Ezekiel does, the false shepherds, the leaders of that day, in contrast to God as the true shepherd. He says this in Ezekiel 34, verses 1 to 4. The word of Yahweh came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says Lord Yahweh, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So he he condemns them. He's against the the false shepherds. But then we see in contrast in verse 11, here's what we read. For thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep, that have been scattered. So I will seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And then in verse 16, he says this, I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the young and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in injustice. I think Jesus is likely thinking about this and this just brings the indictment that much more strongly upon the religious leaders 
Because who are the religious leaders of the day? The Pharisees and scribes. Who are the religious leaders in Ezekiel's day? They're called false shepherds that God is against. Of course, Jesus will make this explicit in John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Just a bonus here. Who is the shepherd who will find the sheep in contrast to the false shepherds in Ezekiel 34? It's God himself. It's Yahweh. But who is it in John 10? Who, who seeks out the sheep and lays his life down for them? It's Jesus in John 10. So Jesus is associating himself as God who seeks out the lost sheep in contrast to the false shepherds. So Jesus is God of very God. After all, how could you know what's happening in heaven and how this rejoicing, you know, how does he know that information? How does he know that? Because he is God. He knows the heart of God because he is God. 1 Peter 2, 24 to 25 says this, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed for you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is why Jesus pursues lost sinners for the joy over a rescued one. And this is why you and I should pursue lost sinners, for the joy of it. This is one of the greatest treasure hunts available to you. You know, people search for these hidden lost treasures. We've got lost souls out there, lost treasure to God to go search and find. Well, that leads us then to the next story, which is about a treasure. It's about a, a piece of money, the lost coin, in verses 8 to 10. We move from a man to a woman and from sheep to silver, the coin was a drachma, also associated with a denarius, which is essentially a day laborer's wage. Why a coin, though? Well, a coin speaks to value. And so let's read this passage here. Or what woman, verse 8, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, you, you might think, oh, you know, you think of dropping a penny, right? You think of like, I would leave that, right? You know, kids love to pick up pennies and stuff, and they're like, sometimes they're gross, they got gum on them, and you're like, oh, leave that thing. <laughs> but this is not like pennies for this woman. Uh, a day laborer's wage, this is, this is quite significant. Some think that may be related to her dowry even. Here's maybe a, a closer illustration for you ladies. Imagine if the diamond in your ring had fallen out. Just those little prongs got a little bit loose. And all of a sudden, you're, you're washing the dishes, and you just kind of look over, and it's gone. <gasps> and of course, you probably like take apart the plumbing and everything, but you're like, okay, it's not there. You're looking through the house. You're going through every room. Where is this thing? And you're like, Okay, dad's going to be home in, you know, two hours. We've got to find this thing. <laughs> He's going to kill me if I lose this thing. No, I don't know. But, uh, but imagine that. The diamond is lost, and you're looking all over the place. Well, the focus, then, on this story is the diligence of the search for that which is valuable to its owner. She realizes she's lost one of these silver coins, so she lights the lamp. She sweeps the, sweeps the house. She seeks diligently. Now, likely, the imagery to put you in the sandals of someone living in this day would be a home that was maybe the size of a one-car garage and possibly didn't have any windows. Uh, and so there's the need to light a lamp and obviously no electricity either. So light a lamp, go searching, sweeping, looking all over for it, maybe sweeping so you can hear if it bounces around. They're likely not perfectly round coins either at this point. But you see uh, just her diligence in looking for this. And then, of course, she finds it. And when she does, it, you know, it's, it's kind of exaggerated here. She invites her friends. And she's like, I found it. You know, I found, maybe you would call or text, you know, oh, I finally found it. You know, your group text after you've been looking for your diamond. Look at verse 10 again. Just so I tell you, there's, more, there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I want you to notice something here. Notice the wording of verse 10. It's slightly different than verse 7. Here in verse 10, it says there is joy before the angels of God. So who is doing the rejoicing here? 
it's not primarily focused on the angels. That's probably what we think about usually. Oh, it's the angels who are rejoicing. But it actually says that rejoicing is before the angels. So who is before the angels in Scripture? Well, it's God. The angels are before God, before his face. So who is the focus of this rejoicing? It's God himself. God is the one rejoicing over the lost sinner. Of course, the angels rejoice with God as, as well as the saints who are before God. But this is God's joy that people join in. And there's actually a lot of passages in the Old Testament that speak about God's joy, the beautiful attribute of God's joy. But my favorite is in Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah is about, it's like world home makeover. You know, it's like, you know, those shows where they have demo day. Well, this is like ultimate demo day of the creation where God is going to decreate on that final day of the Lord uh, or that, that season we know is the day of the Lord and then recreate and restore. And Zephaniah really means hidden treasures. And it's been pointed out that what is the hidden treasure in the midst of God's global judgment? It's these verses. And here's what we read in chapter 3 of Zephaniah, verse 14. It says, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of, Jerus of Jerusalem. Yahweh has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. Yahweh, your God, is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Here is God singing. This is the culmination of world history as God judges the world, and then saves his people and restores them. And what's the, the culminating result? It is God singing. What a moment. What a moment in history when God sings, sings over his people. This is the joy of God over rescuing lost sinners. God is the happy God. This is why it says in Hebrews 12 verse 2 that, we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. If you are lost in your sins today, Jesus will receive you when you repent. And when you do, he will rejoice over you. Listen, he will not reluctantly take you. He will gladly take you with rejoicing. You are his possession by virtue of creation. You bear his image as a human being. And though you are lifeless like a coin in your sin, God can take you and bring you to life, find you no matter where you've been lost, shining the light of the gospel into your heart so that you see the truth and have ears to hear. No matter where you have gone, no matter what you've done, this one can find you. And he delights to receive you. God sees the value of the lost sinner and he makes diligent search to find and recover them. Why should you celebrate over the repentance of lost sinners? Well, two reasons. One, because it's natural to do so. It's natural. Look at what he says in the, both of these stories. He says, what man of you? What woman? In other words, he's saying, you guys, naturally, lost objects, this is how you would act. You would be excited when you found the lost object. How much more than an object of far greater value? It is natural to do so. In fact, if you don't rejoice, it is so unnatural. That's Jesus' point to the Pharisees. It is so unnatural for you to not rejoice, but rather to grumble. While there is rejoicing in heaven, there's grumbling on earth. How is that? How do you not see the dissonance between those two Pharisees? It is natural to do so. Secondly, because it is supernatural. That's why you celebrate. It's a miracle when a sinner repents and turns to God. I mean, the, I think it's uh, Thomas Brooks in his, in his book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And he, he un, uncovers a lot of the lies Satan tells and gives different remedies to apply when, to combat the lies of Satan. And one of the things he says in that book, which was so impactful when I read it, was 
He says, sometimes Satan will convince you of the lie that it is easy to repent. It is an easy thing to repent of your sin. And then he goes on to say how hard it is to repent, how difficult it is to repent. This is why it is a miracle. This is why God has to grant one repentance. So never look at the possibility and prospect of your own sin and say, you know what, I'll just repent after this. I'll just ask for forgiveness. I'll just repent after this. And then I'll just, I'll do it because I know God will forgive me. Whoa, danger, danger, danger. Because it is a hard thing to repent and sin only hardens your heart further. And so we rejoice because we say, wow, they came to their senses because God worked in their heart. They saw their sin for what it was. But also, it's supernatural because this is what God does. God, this is God's disposition towards repentant sinners. And so there's nothing more natural and I guess supernatural, than to agree with God, the creator. It is to run in the stream that the universe is flowing in. God created the universe for people to rejoice in him and be rightly related to him. And so when things are aligned that way, that is the cause for greatest joy. When sinners are restored back to their creator and in a right relationship with him, as God intended, what joy there is. Because now the creation is functioning as God intended for it for these sinners to be restored and redeemed. But, as these Pharisees would learn, as Jesus will expose them, we'll see next time, you can't rejoice over grace experienced by someone else if you haven't experienced grace yourself. And that was their problem. They had never experienced the grace of God. So why would they rejoice over it in someone else's life? Rather, they would grumble. Well, the Lord exposes the hearts of Pharisees and religious leaders by these stories. And it's a reminder for us to never lose the wonder of recovered sinners. It's also a challenge for us to imitate our Lord uh, by seeking out lost sinners in the world. Seeking them out is the greatest treasure hunt of all time, as I said. And there are really, we could maybe say, three main takeaways and applications from this passage and they relate to God's actions in the text. We see God's pursuit of sinners and God's pleasure at sinners' repentance. And so from these, we could see maybe a, we could say there's a worship application. Do you rejoice in what God rejoices in? And then there's a, a welcome application. That Jesus receives sinners like you. So come to him. Whether you are not a believer yet, come to him. He will receive you. Or you are a believer, but You've fallen into some sin. You, you've jumped into some sin, we might say. He will receive you. So there's a welcome in this text to sinners. And then there's also a witness application. It's the question of, of are you involved in the recovery of the lost? Are you aligned with what Jesus is all about? Going after lost sinners. Seeing the joy of God over repentant sinners recalibrates our joy and it reorients us to our mission. Let me pray. Lord, we are grateful to see open to us in Scripture your heart for the lost, your heart for us, your joy over us in that you have rescued us and saved us. And Lord, Sometimes our hearts grow cold and we need them to be warmed yet again by the, by the scriptures, and by your spirit. Lord, may you give us not only the light of understanding about what this text says, but the heat of joy and passion that should correspond with this. May we not just read the words on the page. Yes, of course, there's rejoicing. I affirm it. Yes, it's true. But Lord, may there be a corresponding attitude of response that our hearts would thrill at salvation of our own lives, of family members, of friends, of others we've seen. And Lord, that you would give us just a, a, an aligned mission with, with you, Lord, in seeking out those who are desperately stuck in their sin, and yet we're confident you can bring them out of it and rescue them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, let's respond.